Welcome. Uh, my name is Ashish Jama, professor at the Chan School and at the Medical School, and I'm director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. And we are absolutely thrilled to be sponsoring this event today. Um, this is a really important event for a variety of reasons. The, at a high level, when you think about global health, the U.S. remains, for better or worse, and at times it is for better and at times it is for worse, the most important and dominant player, certainly when it comes to financing, um, but goes, that importance goes well beyond financing. And yet, if you've been awake and paying attention in the last two years, you also know that the U.S., like many countries, is really reconsidering its role in the globe and how deeply engaged it wants to be. And during that reconsideration, the engagement continues. And so we have an absolutely fabulous panel of four of the leading experts in the globe to help us think about these issues. And I won't get much more into them yet, because we'll get into them in quite a, great, a, bit, quite a bit of detail um, when we get there. But before we do, I want to um, have our panelists be introduced, and I'm going to ask uh, one of our rising seniors, Ellis Yo, from the college to come up here and introduce our four speakers. And then what's going to happen is I'll come back up. I'll ask each of our speakers to speak for about five minutes or so on um, their reflections on these issues around U.S. investment in global health, uh, what's working, what's not, where we go. And then I will facilitate a discussion for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll turn it over to you guys to ask questions. And we will go till about 7, uh, or whenever the energy runs out, but no later than 7. Um, and one of our speakers will need to leave a little early, and we will um, uh, be grateful that she came anyway. Um, but let me now turn it over to Ellis Yo, who's a, a rising senior. Um, Majoring a GHHP, right? A global health and health policy secondary, uh, focused really on the intersection between humanities and medicine. Ellis, thank you for uh, introducing the panel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this event. Um, I'm Ellis Yeo. I'm a rising senior at the college. I study English and classics and global health and health policy. Um, I'm here on behalf of Partners in Health Engage. We are a grassroots advocacy arm of the NGO Partners in Health. We have over 50 chapters dedicated to pushing for health equity with an emphasis on health care system strengthening. Um, before I go ahead and introduce our fantastic panel of speakers, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Harvard Global Health Institute, the Harvard University Global Health Forum, the Global Health and Health Policy Secondary Concentration, and the Harvard Health Policy PhD Program. Um, our first speaker is Kate Dodson. Kate is the Vice President for Global Health at the United Nations Foundation. In this role, Kate works to ensure that the UN Foundation is delivering on its commitments to address the health-related sustainable development goals and builds synergies with UN agencies. In its global health work, the UN Foundation works to support U UN agencies and partners that deliver vital health services to people around the world. Our second speaker is Marianne Wentworth. She is the president and chief executive officer of MSH, a global nonprofit that works side by side with leaders in low and middle income countries. Since joining MSH in 2007, Marianne has focused on developing a new strategic vision to guide the organization's broad, decades-long technical expertise in addressing evolving challenges in leadership. Our next speaker is Lois Pace. She is the Global Health Council's President and Executive Director, and a leader who has worked on the ground in more than 10 countries, delivering health programs and mobilizing advocates. Ms. Pace has held leadership positions in global policy and strategic partnerships at Livestrong Foundation and the American Cancer Society. And last but not least, our final panelist is Vanessa Carey. She is a co-founder and the CEO of Seed Global Health. In its flagship program, Seed helped establish the Global Health Service Partnership, a novel public-private partnership with the Peace Corps, PEPFAR, and the countries where GHSP physicians and nurses serve as medical and nursing educators. Concurrent with her role as CEO, she is a physician at MGH and serves as the Associate Director of Partnerships and Global Initiatives at MGH Global Health. With that, please give a round of applause to our speakers.
All right, thank you. Um, just a reminder that when you get really bright, uh, uh, energetic college students to do introductions, it's so much better than if I stood up here and right. yapped at you. So Ellis, that was terrific. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Kate, do you want to get us going and then we'll just go down the, uh, the row in terms of uh, thoughts about the broader issue of U.S. investments in global health, where we are, where we are going, where we should be going. Any, anywhere you want to go. Just a couple of easy questions exactly. to answer on a Tuesday. In three evening, minutes. So. No, I'm kidding. You take <laughs> really your time, five to seven. Yeah. Um, and thank you all for being here, for joining us on the first sunny and beautiful day that we've had in a long time. It is overdue, but uh, and appreciate the, the invitation to join here. So um, I'm going to start actually not by talking specifically about the US, but just a couple of minutes on the broader environment, because I think we are at an inflection point in global health. Um, global health institutions were built largely in the MDG era, with the exception of long-standing UN partnerships and efforts like the World Health Organization, um, to meet Millennium Development Goal needs. They were poverty eradication, disease um, uh, reduction strategies, institutions that were really built for that era. Um, what we are now in is this inflection point in trying to make those institutions and make the kind of way that global health is practiced by donors, including the US and many others, more SDG relevant. And what do we mean by that? The SDGs are the Sustainable Development Goals, a, a group of uh, 17 goals adopted by the global community in 2015, an ambitious agenda to try to uh, support people, planet, and prosperity between now and 2030. And the SDGs are far more interconnected than the kind of previous architecture of thinking about global engagement was. And we're thinking about now in the global health space issues of the intersectionality between fragility and health, between climate and health, in ways that I don't think have been manifest and supported necessarily in the same robust way through the way that the US government has engaged as a global health partner. Uh, so this inflection point is not only playing out in, in a range of different ways in a global context, but also playing out in the US. And this is against now a backdrop of really divisive political tensions that we see in the US. So how the US starts to think and engage and act in a global community of global health practitioners and the contributions that it can make, I think need to, or, or, are challenged by, and the efforts to advance those in a strategic way are challenged by that kind of divisiveness in politics that's happening in Washington. But as Ashish points out, that the US government has been a mainstay in global health funding uh, in the last couple of decades and has played an outside role. And uh, those who are Americans have every right to be supremely proud of the contribution that the US government has made, the generosity of the US government and the way that the US government has been on the right side of history on a lot of issues from addressing HIV AIDS to voluntary access to family planning services to trying to think about the right kind of architecture on global health security. Uh, and some of that is now kind of being challenged, I think we all know, we all would expect by the current administration. <coughs> the second message that I give in the context of the US government, not just you know acknowledging being proud of and supporting that long, deep history is that we are really lucky for Congress right now. There is bipartisan support in Congress for global health, for uh, the US engagement and for assistance programs more generally. Um, and that bipartisan support has worn through lots of political ebbs and flows and tides over the past couple, uh, you know, couple of decades. And it shows no sign of waning. And I think that's really important. But that, we'll talk, I'm sure, more about it in the course of the conversation. That support needs to be bolstered, needs to be encouraged, nurtured. And that's the role that advocates and policymakers can play together. Uh, but you know, apart from Congress, there is still a lot of latitude that the Trump administration has in a global health space. Um, and we're seeing that latitude being expressed in both policy and in funding levers that the administration can push on. Um, the budgets that have come out of the OMB from this administration have shown deep cuts to foreign assistance and global health inside that. 
Um, and uh, thankfully and fortunately, Congress has pushed back and called those dead on arrival and restored a lot of levels of funding. Um, but through different ways that the administration has levers on funding, including things like the global gag rule, which I imagine we'll get into more, um, there are ways that the administration has shown that it's trying to tie the hands of uh, global health players and actors and tie its support to countries, to communities, um, to some uh, non-evidence-based uh, approaches. We're also seeing some of that play out not just in a funding context, but in a policy context. At the UN Foundation, we work a lot on the multilateral and global health policy space that emanates out of WHO, other parts of the UN system. And we're seeing the US express itself through the administration in new ways and we haven't seen these in quite some time around issues especially related to sexual and reproductive health and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So I think we'll get into that probably over the course of this conversation a little bit more. I'll leave it at that since I probably went well over five minutes, but um, look forward to the, to the comments from other colleagues on the panel. Fabulous, Marion. Well, um, greetings and thank you to the organizers, several different Harvard groups, uh, every tub with its own bottom, so several Harvard tubs supporting this, um, and in general for getting the work done to, to bring these folks together. I also, um, because I have a feeling Lois might be a little bit shy, and, and um, <laughs> uh, that, you know, I'm very excited about the Global Health Briefing book coming out. Thank We've you. had a long standing, we at Management Sciences for Health have had a long standing connection to the Global Health Council, okay. um, and we're very, very excited to see it flourishing and growing and, and advancing. So a little plug for, my neighbor's really to the left and the chair on the right, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you've been involved too, Vanessa, <laughs> in any event. Um, Management Sciences for Health is an organization that has, for almost 50 years now, worked in 150 countries to do health system strengthening of one sort or another, really to close the gap between evidence and action in global health. That's what we do, that's what we love to do, um, and that's what we've done consistently. I thought to answer your question, I would um, actually describe a little bit about what, we, what we're doing now and what we think the priority areas are. So rather than how it's funded, what needs doing? Um, and we've just recently gone through a bit of a strategy exercise to talk about where we think our priorities are. And I'll go to four areas. The first is sustainability. Um, and we all want it. Good development actually means doing things that are relevant, respectful, and, um, and right, um, and making sure that, that they're enduring. Um, we don't really, our, uh, Mark Green, the ambassador, um, the administrator for USAID, says that the goal of development is to leave, and in many ways it is. We should actually be working, partnering um, with groups that want to grow, want to learn, and want to take it on their own. Um, so sustainability is definitely an incredibly important part of our work, and knowing in an evidence-based way what's sustainable also matters. Now, donors talk about sustainability in part because it's part of development, but a little bit because they want to leave now, you know, because there are competing funding issues, and, and um, that is an overarching trend um, that matters. Um, but the other reason to really talk about sustainability now is there are a lot more um, states out there that are getting close to middle income, that are ready to stand on their own in many ways. And so how we do our work transitions. There's always fragile states. There's always places where conflict, civil war, um, climate, disaster. Mm -hmm. you know, there's all kinds of disasters. Um, so there are always those places. And some of the more traditional kinds of, of health system strengthening and disaster relief um, apply. But there's also a whole set of folks who are now headed towards the middle. And so the kind of support they need is different. And on that topic, universal health coverage is another theme that's hugely, hugely important. And in this country, universal health care coverage is sometimes not a popular phrase to use. But when you deconstruct it and say that what we're talking about is establishing a good set of basic health services, establishing a reasonable level of quality, and making sure it's both geographically and financially accessible to all people, generally more heads in the room nod. 
um, and there's a lot more support for it. And what's extremely important, though, about using the phrase universal health coverage is that that's the terminology that's being used all over the world. It's what um, constituents want. It's what government leaders want. And it is driving us to talk not just about AIDS and tuberculosis and malaria, hugely important. I could go on forever about the mortality associated with them, but also non-communicable diseases, reproductive rights, and other aspects of health that sometimes don't always fall in the health bucket. Mm -hmm. So I think universal health coverage is a second extremely important theme, and it brings in new kinds of competencies that we in health development need, including health financing and really commercial savvy. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute, because the third theme is whole systems. Um, systems thinking, if you really look at the whole ecosystem of health, and in particular, if you want to create solutions that are relevant and that stick, um, you've really got to be respectful of all the sectors that play in a particular community. That may be local businesses, that may be local faith organizations, that may be government governments. Um, and really what we've seen is that there's an awful lot of mistrust, misunderstanding, lack of common vocabulary across those different organizations. And so we've got those different types of organizations. And so one of the things we've got to do is to find ways to build more bridges. The whole system has to come together in order to deliver universal health coverage, a phrase that starts with universal. Mm -hmm. So I think going from universal to whole makes an awful lot of sense. And then I would be remiss if I didn't talk about data and technology again, just for a thumbnail. This is just a little petit goût de tout, just a little taste of things. Um, and two aspects about data and technology. One is, in a lot of places that we work, there is leapfrogging going on. There are all kinds of encumbrances in high-income countries that are potentially barriers to really new innovation and new kinds of approaches. Um, even for things as simple as electronic health records or trying to get to the point where we task shift enough but maintain standard of care or even improve consistency of delivery of care. There's huge, huge opportunity there. And then when we talk about those markets that are really headed towards middle income or they're newly in middle income, it's time that they make their own decisions about what kinds of technologies and what new innovations they bring into their countries. And for that, they need new tools, like, for instance, health technology assessment, which is something that we at MSH are doing a lot more of as well. So just a little bit of the what as opposed to the how um, to get us started. Thanks. Fabulous. Nice. Hi, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> Thanks again for having us here. Uh, I'm Lois, as you heard from Alice, and I'm actually based in Washington, so I appreciate the condolences regarding what happened here every day. Uh, happy to be outside the Beltway for this evening and just chatting with you all about what happens there every day. I, I can't really say I have all the answers, but we'll try to work through some of your questions tonight, and uh, maybe you'll have some good ideas for me as I go back down. But I, I, I think it's important to sort of, before I get into what Global Health Council does, to say kind of how I got into this space, um, because I started really as more of a program person. Uh, I did a lot of work in community health and outreach. Uh, I did that in the inner city where I'm from in Los Angeles. I did, went overseas and did more of that uh, abroad. And as I did that work, I kept bumping up against a lot of the issues um, that turned out to be policy issues, right? Um, sort of, you know, what leads to food deserts or what leads to sort of a lack of access to, to, to health care um, or health information. Uh, and so I kind of stumbled into the policy space. So I think it's kind of funny now that I live and breathe uh, policy and politics <laughs> on a regular basis, but just know, just know sort of kind of where it all began. And who knows, maybe that will happen with one of you. Uh, one day I have to invite you in that as well. Uh, so uh, with that, though, I think it makes a lot of sense that I ended up at a Global Health Council because in addition to sort of working in the U.S. and abroad and um, working across programs and policy, I also kind of um, have a tendency to see uh, the world of, of health for what it is, everything from AIDS to Zika, and that's really our focus at Global Health Council. A lot of people ask, what's, what's your real focus? What do you care most about? Uh, and we don't have, it's just like in a family, you don't have a favorite child, right? Everything is important. Uh, and it's a really hard job because we, it's a lot to wrap our arms around, uh, especially because that portfolio just continues to broaden. But the way we see it is people are faced with a number of issues around the world and they're whole people. They're not their individual parts. They're not 
individual diseases, but rather, you know, they, they present with a number of different issues, health and otherwise, and it's our responsibility to, uh, to figure out how best to meet their needs, however complicated that might be. Uh, the one thing we do focus on, though, is uh, we are advocacy with the big A. So we, we don't do a lot of program implementation work. We don't do research. We don't, we don't sort of carry, carry that water because we have plenty of excellent organizations in our network who do that. But we do absolutely drive the policy agenda to the extent that we can. And we focus largely on the US government and its role in this space. Um, because we do know, as we've been hearing, that they uh, the, our government, for better or worse, has played a leadership role, and we definitely, um, because of that, need to be tracking uh, that role in those investments. So getting into sort of uh, the, the trends, um, uh, we've already heard about some of the leadership trends and some of the policy trends. I think we at Global Health Council and our community really do find it disturbing that, um, that this administration is sort of tinkering with a lot of different policies that might be detrimental to the work that we do, like the Mexico City policy and expanding that. And as Kate mentioned, we can talk more about it. Um, there's also uh, the, the, the leadership around uh, things like global health security um, or uh, in multilateral <coughs> institutions. And so again, a lot of people can think about funding or policies, but they miss, they miss the, you know, how, how loudly it speaks when the US pulls away from certain conversations. Um, the world takes notice. Uh, and so that's something that, that is also of con great concern to us. But you know, the, the real thing that we are tracking that I haven't, you know, we haven't really touched on too much is, is the, the money, you know, the dollars and cents. And just to give a little bit of perspective, uh, you actually had this decline starting to, during the Obama year. So this is not just a Trump problem. And that's something that's a kind of a misconception I think people have, is that global health funding has been flatlining for about the past decade. So whereas we had sort of the golden era of global health with the emergence of something like the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which, which Bush put into place, we, that has largely gone away. Uh, and so now we are being asked as a community to do more with less, which is increasingly more complicated. So again, we'll get a little bit into that, but that's kind of how I see the, the sands shifting. Um, but Marion, thankfully, alluded to our Global Health Briefing book, which again, if you uh, have not seen it online, there are postcards outside directing you to the website. There's a hard copy here available for you to peruse. Uh, but this is something that we put out every other year for each new Congress, and it's us making the case for global health. There are a number of different chapters that touch on a number of different global health issues. And we do that because, especially now when you, when you think not just about the administration, but people on Capitol Hill, we have a quarter new members in Congress. That's a lot of new brains showing up and trying to figure out what their agenda should be. And not all of them, even the progressives, are thinking about foreign policy or global development. And so we need to show up and really help them understand the work that we do and why they should care about it. Um, and I really want to, again, thank the people uh, on, on this platform and elsewhere who helped us bring that together. Global Health Council is a network of organizations, about 80 organizations uh, to date. Everyone on the stage is a member, including Harvard and also Partners in Health. So thank you <laughs> for being a part of that community. And because we believe that that's really valuable, we, we believe that we're stronger together in all of this. Um, and, and only with sort of all of our voices can we really kind of shape um, the narrative for global health and, and improve um, support for the work that we do. Dr. Carey. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. And I want to really thank the Harvard Global Events student, Ashish, for uh, assembling this. I think it's a really important conversation, and you guys have been tremendous conveners, so I Thank appreciate you. that. Uh, and to my co-panel, I feel very humbled because I, I, all of you have been uh, extraordinary influences on my life and my thinking, so I thank you. Um, you know, a lot of what I would want to talk about has been said. It's both the, it's the advantage of going last, right? Um, you get to sort of pick and choose what you want to highlight, and I think that um, you know, one of the things that is very interesting for me is the U.S. government's engagement in global health. Because it, it's, you have these extraordinary things like PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plans for AIDS Relief, where 15 billion went into a global health effort. And it really was transformational. It was the first time any kind of gigantic sum of money was put into a global health problem. And we actually saw a whole massive shift. And what it did was it unlocked people's brains to what was possible if we put our minds behind it. 
really important, actually, because I think most people always had viewed, if you look at the history of global health, it started as tropical medicine in the late 1800s with you know, white workers coming from Europe dying of diseases in Africa and people wanting to go down and save their workers. And then the kind of there's an evolution to this idea of tropical medicine or like or moving on to some international health, which was, well, shoot, maybe these people are dying too. We should take care of them. And then it finally shifted into global health, which was this idea that actually we're pretty interconnected around global health problems. And by the way, global health is local too. We have an epidemic of black mothers dying in the United States in childbirth that is higher than most mortality rates around the world. So this is not just a problem of us versus them or outside of borders. And one of the most comprehensive definitions of global health I've ever seen was a paper put out by Copeland et al. in Lancet around 2009 that did the best job of defining it. What I love is it's basically the global health is everything everywhere. It's transnational. It's a series of problems that involves regulation, economics, health, access, a whole number of things. It is uh, not just sectoral to health, but has implications that um, cross sectors. It has implications that cross borders. It's not like malaria gets to the border of Rwanda and DRC and says, oop, I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think increasingly people are feeling that. It's also about the spectrum of care, right? It's prevention, care, you know, sort of um, post-care delivery, financing. It, it's just so complicated. And we have to acknowledge that. But the beauty of it is, is that it means there's an opportunity for no matter what you do, whether you're an architect, an artist, a, in business, you could be engaged in solving global health problems. And so in many ways, when we go think about the US government's involvement, they've been transformational. And we should commend them for that. At the same time, you know, there has been kind of a flatlining. And now we're just kind of in a struggle of, are we or aren't we engaged in global health? We have a president mm -hmm. who keeps trying to cut the budget. We have a Congress that keeps actually upholding the budget, and in some cases, increasing the budget a little bit. Maybe other parts drop, some parts go up. But are kind of holding strong. But we're conflicted about what we want to do and how much it matters, especially when we have domestic problems. And I want to make the argument a little bit to reframe it, that there's actually, um, we have an obligation as a US government, as a globe, as anybody who has access to resources, thought, or influence, to be engaged in global health. Because at the end of the day, health is fundamental to everything we do. We started talking about the SDGs. You look at the 17 sustainable development goals, whether it's poverty or life on land or climate change, every single one relates to health, not just three, which is health and well-being. If you are poorer, you are more likely to die sooner and have less access to health care. If you are a woman, you are less likely to be able to access the health services you need. So we want to be thinking, I think, a little bit about the importance of health. There's also great data that shows that health is linked to economic growth. So on a macroeconomic level, we know that countries that invested in health intentionally had huge economic booms that followed. Vietnam, Rwanda, there's a list of them that have very intentional investments. We know on a microeconomic level that if a household has somebody get sick, then with an NCD, for example, 25% of those households will fall below the poverty line. A study in Zambia showed that when the main breadwinner died of HIV in Lusaka, 60% of those households had an 80% decline in income. 67% um, of the houses, about 60% of the houses had to move to cheaper housing. 40% of houses lost access to running water. 21% of girls stopped going to school, and 17% of boys stopped going to school. So there's really real linkages among all of this that we should be thinking about. So it shouldn't be an either or argument. It should be a yes and argument because this is what unlocks to the next thing. And we should start reframing in every conversation how health relates to what we're doing. And so if we are smart and we're investing in a global economy, we should be investing in health. A three-year-old, as my country director in Uganda pointed out to me, a three-year-old got sick with Ebola in 2013, December of 2013. One case, the failure of emergency services, a failure of surveillance and data, a failure of an ability to care for the patient directly led to a $53 billion economic shutdown, slowdown. And you know what? Only about, and she, she knows the data a little bit already, I think only about 26 billion of it was actually directly related to Ebola. Mm -hmm. The rest of that money was because of the loss of health services, the loss of people, the loss of private sector investment, and all the things that followed. So we have all the data there. We just have to make different choices. 
It's been interesting because Seed Global Health, and thank you for your opening remarks. I think, you know, and, and it's interesting because when I heard you talk about the flagship program that we started with the Peace Corps, it was a wonderful program. Believe in challenging government. We got the US government to help build a cadre of health professionals that served as faculty to teach and train a rising generation of health professionals in Sub-Saharan Africa. Trained over 16,000 in five years and helped invest in this new pipeline of future faculty. Shut down. We were told in February 2018 that we'd lose all our funding in September of 2018. Mm. So we had to go through a major strategic overhaul. And so SEED now has launched this new strategic overhaul, and we still do what we did before. We're focused on education. We're focused on clinical care. But we're focused on public policy now and advocacy because we can't make the argument about the importance of training, the importance of investing in people if we don't have people understand this larger framework of health. So it's, I love what we're going to talk about today. I think this is the meat of what we should be wrestling with. And my goal is to have all of you go out and be ambassadors for the cause and to help become champions of change and to help reframe the argument with whoever you interact with. So thank you. Wow, awesome. Let's do a big round of applause for the speakers. So that, that is a fabulous way to get us started. Um, lots of ways we can go. And I want to just, I want to jump in to the broader theme of US engagement abroad. And so at Harvard College, global health and health policy is the most popular secondary field. So our students are completely engaged and all bought in on this. And we've got a few of GHHB students that I see. Um, but more broadly, and even to, I mean, people on both sides of the political aisle, um, ask the question, and in some ways, this president's um, kind of disdain for global en engagement represents a set of views that a lot of people have that can be as simple, and some of it is xenophobic, but some of it is simply, you know, we've got lots of problems here. We've got an epidemic of maternal mortality, especially for African-American women. We've got measles outbreak in New York, and we've got 10% of our population still uncovered. We're gonna spend billions abroad? Doesn't, doesn't quite feel right. Um, so what's the case to Americans who feel like there are enough problems to be dealt with here to invest in global health when it feels like we ought to take those dollars and put them here. And I'm happy to have any of you start it. And um, well, I'm happy to well, yeah. jump in. Um, yeah, because I answer this question every day. So do you I have bet you do. an hour? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, first, um, the first place I go is because it's the right thing to do. And quite frankly, when you look at you know, what Americans donate to foreign assistance, for instance, it's threefold what it is what the US government donates. And by the way, a little parenthetical in there, if we took foreign assistance to zero, we wouldn't solve a deficit problem, we wouldn't solve any of our other problems here at home. Because the amount we invest, is, as Sorry. large as the numbers sound, is a tiny, tiny percentage of our overall budget. But why the heck should we do it? It's actually in our national self-interest, just for Americans. First, disease does not respect borders, walls, government boundaries. So a disease that happens in the littlest corner of the world can easily be here in 36 hours. Um, it's, uh, you know, a wall's not gonna fix that. <laughs> and it's much more cost effective to address that disease, to find it early before it becomes an outbreak, find it, uh, deal with an outbreak before it becomes an epidemic, and certainly deal with an epidemic before it becomes a pandemic. That's hugely, hugely important. So that's one. We are an interconnected chain of health systems all across the globe. We are not an island nation when it comes to health. Um, two, it's actually in our economic interest. Um, we have a huge fraction of um, our country um, that is interested in doing business in various parts of the globe. And getting involved in health is a great way to establish relationships, understand context, um, grow economies in other parts of the organization Doctor uh, of the world. Dr. Kerry already pointed out that the, you know, health and education are the two places that are correlated with positive GDP. Now probably some other development actually has positive benefits too, but those two we've got data on. So growing economies is wonderful, and it's not only wonderful for American businesses, and therefore American jobs at home, quite frankly, but it's also wonderful for having more political stability. Stronger economies are correlated with much better um, political stability as well. And lastly, on the security issue, on the broad security issue as opposed to the health security issue, um, it 
soft power matters. Creating, a, uh, creating opportunities and relationships so that our military can operate, so that our, our diplomacy can operate, et cetera, matters. And health is a wonderful, I don't know how many ambassadors I've met <laughs> who have been trained as like lawyers and all sorts of other things who say, I love health, because health is tangible. Health is measurable. People appreciate health. It affects everyone. You know, it's, it's a great place for us to be from a diplomacy perspective as well. Vanessa? Just to add yeah, one other piece. Yeah. Um, in that we also know that when we are, as, as individuals, when we engage and work overseas or abroad, uh, we are more likely to actually come back and work with at-risk populations, social determinants of health, to work with and wrestle with some of the issues we have in this country. There's pretty robust data now that shows that people who engage in any kind of global health activity will work with, um, have better, specifically for physicians, for example, they have better understanding social determinants of health, they have better clinical skills, they're better historians, better educators, more likely to work with at-risk populations and underserved populations here in the US. And certainly with SEED, of the 191 US faculty we've sent abroad to work that have come back, over 85% are working in education or with academics or with at-risk populations here. So I think that there's also just um, an ability to understand, uh, you know, sort of what's happening in the world. And when we think about increasing migration now, and we also think about a failure of a health system here to take care of problems, it's not unrealistic to see somebody come in with rheumatic heart disease that has advanced to a very late stage. So having exposure to some of the things that I actually think we're going to start seeing here is important as well. Great. And Lois, were you going to add something to that? Yeah, I was, although I just love that our members do my job for me and say <laughs> all the talking points that I love to use on the Hill. And, and, and I, you know, again, just to reiterate what Marion was saying, it's morality, it's economy, it's stability. That's the three-legged stool we've been using, especially the past three years. Um, and, it, and it has resonated, and I think it's important to maintain all three because, um, you know, it's, it's one thing, I think there's this, this perception that we can only talk, make the security argument down in Washington, and not only is that not necessarily effective, but it's, um, it's just, it's not, it's not all we want to be using. And it's not, even for conservatives, right? There are plenty of conservatives who are aligned with faith-based organizations who really lean into that morality argument, and they've expressed concern that we are too focused on security and stability. So I just want to really drive that point home. But beyond that, um, I really want to touch on, um, um, well, a couple of things. One is, even in the preparation for this panel, I could appreciate the, um, the reference to solidarity. And I don't want that to get lost. So in other words, we don't just have to think about sort of what our best narrative is um, to, to allow us to get in the door, but really the values on which we want to stand. And, and that's been something I think a lot of us, sorry, my mic's running out, uh, uh, that a lot, a lot of us have been struggling with in this space in general. And I think all advocates across all social issues are now dealing with this, really saying, OK, well, what's going to work with people in power, but also what do we need to stand on? And I think Kate has a, has a great expression that they use at UN Foundation, principled pragmatism, right? Like, you want to do something that works, but, but you absolutely need to stand your ground in terms of principles and really understand what those are. So, so that's something that we have been really reflecting on um, at the Global Health Council, and it's something that I'd, I'd love to have a broader conversation about. Um, one last thing on this particular issue, kind of what breaks through, is uh, Kaiser, one of our other members, Kaiser Family Foundation, put out a, a poll that they do on a regular basis uh, assessing public perceptions of global health. And to Marion's point, a lot of people uh, around the country really think we spend a lot more than we do when really it's less than 1% of the federal budget. But I will add that a lot of those people also are fully in support of the investments that we make in global health. There's still a majority of Americans who want us to keep spending taxpayer dollars on this. However, what's really come through this year is that the partisan divide is widening. And that is disturbing because, as you heard from all of us, especially Vanessa, like, we, we have enjoyed a lovely bipartisan relationship um, when it comes to global health. And I fear, even with all the support we've had from Congress to date, that, um, that will now sort of fall along partisan lines. And I do think that that would be very detrimental to the work we've been trying to do. So let me ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, so the US has not really pulled back that much financially. I mean, we've seen this kind of flat, 
which in essence represents a right a cut over time. Um, but it's still the dominant player. But certainly the words coming out of the president, coming out of the administration, not just in global health, but kind of just more broadly, um, less of an interest in using soft power, more transactional, uh, more thinking about kind of what's in it for us. How has this affected other countries, kind of other big players in global health? And I'm thinking, on one hand, countries like Germany, UK, that sort of followed a bit more traditional model of engagement with multilateral uh, organizations like WHO. And then I'm thinking about countries like China, which are going their own way. So how do you see the changing dynamics within the US affecting other major players? And why don't we start and go down the, the road again, if that's OK, Kate? Sure. Um you know, the, the, I'll lift up one of Lois's last comments about the kind of partisan nature that's starting to exhibit in terms of even, you know, citizens and constituents and their attitudes around global engagement, and in this case, global health. That's, not, that's playing out in a lot of donor countries. And that tension um, is, is real. And it's one of the reasons why Development Assistance for Health has flatlined not just in the US, but globally. And so as the U.S. is, you know, potentially teetering on some shifts, in, major shifts in funding and access to funding, especially on things like sexual and reproductive health and rights and access to voluntary family planning, that deficit, you know, which is in the now a couple of hundred million dollars per year that the U.S. government has received <coughs> on international reproductive health and family planning, cannot be made up by other donors. And I think that's a really important, ten, you know, it's a tension that is exhibited elsewhere as well. Um, you know, I won't, I won't tackle the China question probably explicitly, but I will also say that, you know, we've had a set of work that's been going on with the African Union uh, over the past couple of years in trying to mobilize and secure great, greater domestic resources for health. Um, and part of that is a challenge of overall increasing the pie in the overall domestic resource base that African governments may have. So progressive taxation policies, avoiding you know, um, tax loopholes and, and escaping uh, finances. So you know, dealing with that big problem and then thinking about the allocation even within health system. But we had a big moment in um, February when uh, President Kagame, from, uh, who was chairing the African Union at the time, stepped up and said, you know what? You all are saying that you're going to decline your resource base, you know, your overall development assistance for health. We see the writing on the wall. We know we have to step up more. And, that, and they signed a, something called, the, uh, through the Africa Leaders Meeting, a really significant commitment to increase, partner with the private sector in Africa and elsewhere, and really mobilize a progressive uh, amount of um, domestic resources for health. So that's an important trend, right? So we're not just thinking about donors. We're not just thinking about China, but we are also thinking about the countries themselves that, as Marion pointed out, are starting to think about their own economic future in a very different way and realizing how much they have to spend on health issues. That's great. I like that. So, it, so not just a America goes down and Germany steps up and UK steps up or China steps up, but everybody else starts thinking this is the climate is changing mm -hmm. and we've got to take a whole different strategy. Um, Marion, what, what do you see on the global landscape in terms of with American retren retrenchment to the extent that it exists? Um, how are other countries uh, thinking about that and, and dealing with that? And at some point, I'd love it if somebody would tackle China on the panel. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> uh, I really like okay. it. <laughs> uh, I, I can't understand why you chose not to, but I think um, yeah. it'd be really helpful. I but Marion. Take the first hit and then you can bring it home later. Oh no, <laughs> you can just take the hit. It's fine. I'm just, it, it's so important to, first of all, Blessings on anyone that, that is trying to do good. And, you know, I understand that countries are not monolithic and that every person in the population is not necessarily, you know, responsible for the acts of government. But I, I'm very, very frustrated with the approach that I see that China's taking in the countries where we operate. Um, and there are, there are several reasons for it. One, there's a certain amount of smart economics going on. The kinds of infrastructure and so forth that, that China tends to or that I see them investing in is really securing the roads that get to their mines, securing the bridges, you know, the ports, et cetera. I, I, and some of that's actually very sensible, bridge building, 
um, to create relationships, to open up markets, et cetera, and it's doing a lot of good and helping a lot of people in the short term. The places where I'm extraordinarily frustrated are really, I guess I'll pick on two. Um, one is um, most of what China is doing is lo are loans. Um, and almost all of what China is doing so far that they've said they're going to call in those loans, they have called in those loans, and so they're taking over. Um, and I feel that's actually not a partnership model. I think that's an exploitation model, and I'm very, very frustrated with it. So that's kind of shot number one. Number two is a little softer, which is that really all the infrastructure work that, that China does, most of the time, they bring their own labor as, mm -hmm. as well. So they're missing an opportunity to capacity build, to contribute to the economy beyond um, the work that they're doing. Um, that might make it move faster. There may be, you know, I'm going to pretend for a minute that there's some positive intent there, but I think there's a lot of negative intent, quite frankly. But, you know, I'm not there. I don't know. Um, but the result is negative. It's a huge amount of missed opportunity. Um, and it's a huge amount of cultural insensitivity. And we've been victims in the past. Um, but I would hope that we would all learn from history. Mm. Yeah, Thank you. Shot. Um, Lois, uh, yeah. other countries, and you don't have to deal with China if you don't That's want okay. to, but um, <laughs> what's your sense of what's happening in the UK, in Germany, in Japan, kind of the big, relatively wealthy countries? How are they seeing the US engagement, and what are they doing? Um, yeah, I think you look at, um, I mean, I'll, I'll point to, to the Global Fund as an example, um, which is, uh, you know, it's this global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, and the way that that work is funded is really, it's, it's a pooling of all, of all country um, contributions. And I think a lot of um, countries in this moment now of replenishment are really looking at the, how the U.S. Is, is responding. And so, I, you know, just to try to answer your question concretely and given like a current event, um, there is, I don't want to say there's a wait and see approach, but the U.S. generally leads in this space. And if they're starting to pull back or question their own investments, then we're worried about a ripple effect. What we did see, though, um, is you know around something like women's health, it was encouraging, I think, for a lot of us to see the Scandinavian countries step up, Canada step up. Um, the reality, though, is they can't they can't fill that vacuum. Uh, and and so you know back to. Um, what we're saying about alternatives. I mean, I really want to drive home this point and maybe even be together like the, the conversation about domestic resource mobilization with kind of the China conversation, which is we need to come up with a new model for global health and development. I mean, we, we've done a lot of good and we, I, I think that a lot of what we have done um, as a country has worked. A lot of what we have put in place also is problematic and um, is not sustainable. And I'm not surprised that governments are you know, saying yes to alternatives that, you know, show up on their door doorsteps, whether from China or otherwise. Uh, and the reality is, um, you know, the most encouraging part of all this uh, is that countries are defining for themselves um, what they need and how they're going to accomplish those goals. Uh, and increasingly more, I think, whether we're the U.S. or, or European countries or elsewhere, you know, we need to let them do that um, because that has been very difficult, I think, you know, when you're talking to these ministers, which Vanessa can speak to, they have found it very difficult to kind of um, manifest their destiny, I guess. Uh, so I'll pass the baton on to my partner here. So I, I think it's, um, it, I think it's, uh, I think the fact that we need a new model is right. I think for many, many reasons. One, this like donor heavy model, come in and save the day, has created a very screwed up dynamic, which actually has made many African countries welcome the Chinese, because the Chinese have come in and said, let's do business. I'm not going to give you charity. I'm going to invest in you. You're going to pay it back. And there's, it's a change in attitude that's actually been quite welcomed. Now, how that has been structured may not be working well, to the point of the loans being called back is really a problem. But my understanding is that there's been a bit of a pushback from a larger global community to the Chinese to say, hey, you're too aggressive, everything's going to fail, including your investments. If you call back these loans now, maybe you need to restructure. And they're thinking about that a little bit. Um, and so, you know, I, but I, uh, to speak to the infrastructure building, um, my issue with it, too, is that the infrastructure they have built is totally transactional to get something else for exploitation purposes, for the most part. Access to mineral rights, something like that. But the quality of what they're building is a problem for me. I toured a brand new facility in Tanzania and Dar es Salaam 
at Muhambili University, largest teaching hospital in Tanzania, over 1,200 new inpatients daily is their turnover. Wow. They built a whole new cardiac surgical unit, recognizing the burden of disease and a desire to be able to care for their population at all levels so there's no more medical tourism out of the country. Brand new facility, and I was getting toward the operating room, and I went to open the operating room, and the handle broke off my hand. And that's not the only story like that. That has been kind of a consistent story for me. But so the quality, I think, for me is an issue a little bit, too, with the Chinese, in addition to sort of how things are structured. I think, though, um, so we have to see where it's going to fall. I think that the biggest issue is what is the agency of these countries and these governments? Because at the end of the day, you know, donor funds are going to be part of solving this problem. There's still never going to be enough donor funds, right? So there needs to be better recuperation of taxation of corporations coming in, increased financing. There needs to be insurance systems. There needs to be universal health care so that you can run the risk pool. There needs to be a whole number of structural changes that has to be country-led by the countries themselves. That becomes an issue of capacity in these countries and an opportunity for people to come into positions of leadership who are well trained, have had an opportunity to get a solid education, have the skill set they need to lead. But then it's also a little bit an opportunity for some of the international entities to not rain on that parade. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> an unnamed African country, the Minister of Health told me the IMF will not let him invest any more in human resources for health in his country because they won't allow him to with their loan structure. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. He wants to. He knows he has a population of people who need jobs. He knows people are essential to being able to deliver health care. He literally can't without having a domino effect somewhere else. So for me, it really falls actually in like, what is it? How do we empower these countries to have agency to make the decisions they need, have the capacity they need? Failed or fragile states is a different question that I'm not going to tackle right now. But I think there's a real change in leadership in many of these countries and an opportunity if we're all thoughtful about sort of unshackling how we deliver our support and our aid. Fabulous. Marion, you need to leave, but I just want to say t thank you for being here. Thank you for extraordinary leadership at MSH in just two short years that you've been there. Um, so thank you for that. And it was lovely. And big round of applause for Marion. All right. So I know I promised that I would turn it over, but I have to ask one more question. Sorry, guys. Um, and that is because it's very hard not to be watching the news every day and see what's happening in DRC around the latest Ebola outbreak. So for those of you who have uh, been paying attention, there has been an outbreak going on in DRC for eight months or so, maybe. Uh, I, I, about 15, 1,600 people, more than 1,000 have died. It's now the second biggest outbreak in history. And no signs of letting up. Things are getting worse, not better. And, and it's in the context of the fact that we now have a vaccine that's really pretty effective. Um, and there are a lot of reasons. But one of them certainly is, actually probably the, the, one of the dominant ones, is it's in a conflict zone. And in a conflict zone, it's very, very hard to do basic public health, which is fundamental to bringing Ebola under control. The reason, ultimately, that Ebola came under control in West Africa in 2014, 2015, was through basic public health, identifying people who had cases, tra uh, tracing their contacts, isolating people, uh, and taking care of the people who got sick. Um, that has been very difficult in the DRC. And WHO, I think everybody agrees, has done a much better job this time around, like night and day. Um, and yet, it's not getting better. And I think uh, there is a sense that when it gets really complicated, you need real US leadership. Yeah. And while the US has been willing to write some checks and has been willing to do stuff, um, to some extent, it hasn't been completely AWOL. Um, it certainly has not had a front and center leadership role. I think we can all agree on that. Yes. Um, so the question for you guys is it's a two-parter, really one, but is do you see that turning around? And do you worry that this is a model where when crises hit, America will not step up? Because when crisis hit in West Africa under President Obama, the, the US did step up. You could argue a little late. You could argue all sorts of issues. But it did step up. Um, not seeing a whole lot of signs that the US is going to step up. So crisis public health, global health situation, US leadership is fundamental, and yet it feels like it's a little bit lacking. So first, do you agree with that? And second, um, are you worried about what the future holds? Yeah, I am worried about it. And it's, it's again, 
small topic. <laughs> um, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's also very inconsistent, right? Um, and it's inconsistent in two ways. So with the recent um, DRC outbreak, you had Redfield, the head of the CDC, actually kind of talking out of turn um, and expressing his own frustration that we weren't as active because he recognizes the great role that CDC can play um, in an outbreak situation. Again, that they brought other resources to bear in West Africa and we can do the same in DRC. Um, but then it's also inconsistent because you have a Venezuela or you have a Yemen or you, it, I don't know if the administration is really on the same page regarding kind of where it responds and where it doesn't. So it's hard to answer that part of your question, which is it, whether or not this is a trend, because it does feel, seem to be sort of case by case. Or um, chaotic. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No. <laughs> but, and, and that's, you know, it's, it's frustrating. And it's, again, what is the policy agenda? Maybe, maybe we'll get some clarity around that in the coming weeks. And our sense from some conversations and from pushing the administration a bit on this, or more than a bit on this, is that we might get some more clarity. We're hoping to hear more at World Health Assembly, perhaps, in a few weeks, to see if the US has a more vocal position around it. Because the reality is, if this spins out of control, I think people are going to ask, which it very well can at the sort of drop of a dime, people are going to ask where we were in this moment. And nobody wants a repeat of West Africa, or even worse, which is what we're facing. DRC, to their credit, have, you know, they've done a great job by beating back these outbreaks repeatedly that they've had over the years. But again, the, the, the situation now with the, the sort of, uh, with all of the different issues involved with security, with fragility, um, it's, it's, it's something that um, it behooves all of us to show up in this moment. And it's coming back to like how we are not, this is not just a health issue at this point, right? Like it's an issue across, across um, you know, various sectors and, and, and um, you know, WHO, even though they have shown up, I mean, they lost a health, they have, they've lost health workers in all of this and they won't necessarily be able to sort of withstand this um, in the long term. So that's my biggest concern. Vanessa? I think it's incredibly concerning. Um, and I think that, you know, it's very interesting because actually like the day the WHO declared an outbreak in the DRC was the day the Trump administration tried to reclaim the $250 million emergency fund that had been left over from the West Africa response yeah. for just this purpose, because it took so long to free and mobilize the kind of money needed to respond to West Africa. And I do agree with you. They respond. They also started their response too late, 100%. Um, so I think that, but they realized also once they started it, it took so long that they left a slush fund intentionally to respond to the next outbreak really rapidly. And, and Trump tried to reclaim it that day that the WHO, and then he kind of backpedaled. And so I think it is highly concerning because this was preventable to get to the numbers it was at right now, and we haven't gone there. If you look at the trend month by month on the DRC's like reported site, um, it is actually trending exactly like West Africa did. We are on exactly the same trajectory, and we, next month would be the flashpoint that we start to get out of control, which I think we're well poised to do. Positive things in the DRC, they actually are tracking it really well. They have a history of combating right. Ebola effectively. They have the capacity in many ways. The issue is this the conflict zone, to your yeah. point. So there are certain times the US military is extraordinary in global health situations. Responding to logistical crises and kind of setting up treatment and getting control of a situation they have done time and time again really well in a global health crisis. And they could do this in a heartbeat if they wanted to. It's interesting because you distinguish between a Venezuela or a Yemen and here. This is really, the problem is, is that this is the DRC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just call it. Call it. It's racist. Mm -hmm. It's Africa. It doesn't have any kind of political kind of weight for our purposes for this administration. And so the moral, there's no moral authority here to respond in the way that there should be. That has been demonstrated historically over the last two years in a really incredible way. And this is a moral question. And by the way, we've been on the wrong side of moral history with administrations of both parties. So this is not a political statement. It's a moment in time statement that I'm trying to make. And I think we have a real, so we, here's the key that I think we can play, to your point, because it is kind of chaotic. And, the risk with this administration is you don't know when they're going to double down or when they're going to yield to pressure. 
but they're not doing anything right now anyway. And nobody is in a position of leadership high enough to flip the switch, right, who is interested in this to flip the switch high enough. So I actually think the only prayer of this is massive international pressure with common sense facts about how the US is at risk, right? The US freaked when Ebola came to Dallas. That was like the major turning point. But so I think if we can get a crisis in the US from this, I hate to say it, that will flip the switch that I think will make people, or there's enough pressure about the threat of a crisis that he can be convinced that he's the savior, we could flip the switch. But it's not, it's not gonna be for any moral reason. It's gonna be because we find some very self-interested, ego appealing something. But I think we have an obligation as a population to create that somehow, not yeah. bring Ebola here, but push it. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> and is there, I mean, I understand this is complicated because now we're getting into foreign policy, but is there just not enough um, capacity in Congress to push the administration to act? And I mean, because you're going to need a bipartisan approach. This is not one where this is just going to come out of the House. It's going to have to include some. But there are people in the Senate who care about this, who were around five years ago, who um, will do stuff on both sides of the political aisle. So yeah. last question. And then, and then I will open it up to uh, everybody else. Sorry, guys. Well, These guys are amazing. So I am, it's hard for me to not keep asking them questions. <laughs> well, they, they won. They did drop a bit. I mean, the Congress is responding, and it's, it, it's probably response light. But um, they reintroduced a bill that um, was introduced last year to sort of codify the, um, the, basically the global health security agenda. So Congress is trying to do what it can to you know, protect the funding that Vanessa's talking about or otherwise really solidify the US response in these cases. Yep. It might be slow going, and there are lots of fights that, that people on the Hill are fighting. But this is, I do still feel that um, global health security um, offers some promise of progress. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hopeful about the congressional sort of partnership in this advocacy. I think the issue is whether they can actually appropriate the money that won't get vetoed out of some principle. I think like there's a little bit of a battle there. That, yeah. but, but so far, it's right. Okay, well, why don't we have hands up and, and get questions, and as we go to them, I mean, ultimately, go ahead, over there. Yeah, person in the middle. I mean, ultimately, it would really help to have leadership from the White House. Okay, sorry. We, we don't doubt. For sure. A, a czar, perhaps. <laughs> but bizarre you bring up a idea. very good point about the Congress. <laughs> Thank you so much. And can you just go ahead and introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Alexander. I'm a student at the Fletcher School um, and also Tufts University School of Medicine. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts. The US has been a global leader in securitizing health since probably the Clinton administration. Um, and I was wondering, I see today like a schism kind of happening in global health between those who are advocating for the universal health coverage agenda with the WHO and then those advocating for more of the global health security agenda with like the US and Japan. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you see a tension there um, or if you see synergies um, and how you think um, the US's kind of security agenda has shaped global health over the last decade or so. It's a fabulous question. I'm happy to start. Do you want to do one question at a time? Yeah. Um, so I actually think part of that is just a, it's a, it's a piece about the narrative less than a piece about practice for the U.S. government. You know, the vast majority of work that the U.S. government does on global health issues is kind of the bread and butter dimensions of basic kind of primary health care, right? It's on HIV AIDS, on maternal and newborn child health, on access to immunization. And, and so I don't think that's actually necessarily being borne out in the way that the U.S. government, even over the past handful of years, has, um, has committed and obligated and then used it, the, its funding that's been appropriated and its work on global health. I think part of it then becomes around the narrative and the argument. We already talked a lot about that. You know, what might resonate across the aisle through political divides? You know, is there a common narrative? And are we securitizing the narrative even more than we're securitizing the health assistance that the U.S. government provides? Point. Dr. Tedros has is you know eloquent on this issue, and he's trying to be mindful. The head of the World Health Organization, he's been there for almost two years trying to be mindful of that dynamic. And a lot of it really played out, you, you said in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak, it was down to basic public health. It was also down to basic primary health care. And I think what he talks about is universal health coverage and global health security are two sides of the same coin. You can't have effective global health security preparedness or prevention, or frankly even response, without a strong 
primary health care system on the, you know, as a progressive pathway towards universal health coverage. And he's right. And I, you know, the Japanese government, I think, gets that. You know, so part of what the, the challenge here is, is can you, can you separate the kind of the investment strategies, the program strategies from the, the political narrative that's being deployed? That, that is a fabulous point. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody break those apart as clearly as that. So that is, that was awesome. Like, stuff you learn <laughs> over there. Yeah, please. And if you could introduce yourself and. Well, we're, we're recording, so it'll be easier for you. Ah, sure. Michelle Morris, I'm an internal medicine doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, my question is uh, kind of two parts, but they are very connected. Um, Jim Kim gave grand rounds at Brigham and Women's a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about the fact that by 2030, the World Bank data suggests that the only continent with high levels of extreme poverty is going to be, perhaps not surprisingly, Africa. Um, and so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about um, how we should be talking about that mm -hmm. as it connects to investments in global health overall, whether you think it's um, uh, a coincidence or not is a whole nother set of questions. And then the second part of that same question is there is now a lot of dialogue, especially amongst Democratic candidates for um, 2020 around reparations and reparative justice. And that doesn't seem to have trickled into our conversations about mm. global health and development at all. I don't hear any of those candidates who are talking about domestic reparations talking about reparations in terms of global health, globalization, colonialism, et cetera. And I'm thinking specifically of the example of brain drain where we have 40% of our doctors in this country who are international grads, mm. many of whom who got like a free med school education at a public school in their home country those medical schools and populations are losing, you know, some of the most intel, you know, powerful resources that they have with no compensation and our health system relies on them. So it'd be a great target for reparative justice and global health as well. So and maybe can you connect those two pieces as well? I like that for you. So the, the brain drain question is really complicated because there's, um, so there's, there's a lot there. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so I think that um, you know when we talk about extreme poverty, I guess to start with the sequentially, and we think about it, um, I want to be careful because I think health is responsible for huge portions of it. Because if you don't have a healthy population, you are not able to access. You know, private investment doesn't come in. You you can't go to work yourself. You. Um, your household suffers. You are more likely to grow up socioeconomically disadvantaged if you've lost a parent at a young age. Um, so there's all sorts of loops that definitely link to health. And I think that if we could change the health profile of the continent, it would go a long way to changing the economic profile of the continent. That said, the issues around poverty in Africa run far outside of health, too, in terms of I think a history of a failure to invest in the civil service, uh, the, the after colonialism and the independence, there would not, never been an effort to build kind of um, some of the basic systems in these countries that are needed to function. And so all of a sudden, you had appropriately, you know, you lost the the sort of the the colonial infrastructures, but there was nothing to replace it. So you were asking the rising leaders to try to build something out of absolutely nothing and to step into a global economy that they had never really been able to participate in and have never been allowed to catch up. And then you threw structural adjustment programs on top of that. And there's just like a long history of badness there that needs to get kind of untangled. And if we're really honest, there's a bit of a leadership crisis on the continent too that I think there's a change now happening that I'm super excited about with some really extraordinary leaders. But you know, it's not like Chad has got outstanding leadership right now. So I think that there's, there's a tension there that we have to be honest about. So it's a complicated question. I think health is central to it, though. And I think education is central to it. And I think that we need to be very thoughtful about how we support capacity building, which brings me to the second part of your question, which is what we do is capacity building. And the brain drain question for me is also very complicated because there's push factors and there's pull factors, right? So a lot of countries around the world have actually created policies that do try to siphon off talent from other countries. 
And there is an interesting question about repatriation, I mean, about sort of, you know, reparations that should be paid for siphoning off the talent and, and having policies that suck that talent out of countries. But there's also push factors. It is a human right, I think, to be able to move freely. And if you want to have a different education for your children and you want to have a high paying job or you really want to be somewhere else, you should be allowed to go because at the end of the day, these are health systems that are so broken. The main reason people leave their country isn't because they aren't paid necessarily enough, although that is a problem. It's because they can't practice what they trained in. There's no professional development opportunities. They don't have schools for their children. They don't have the tools they need to actually practice in their trade. And it's been interesting because the seed has been doing work and we have been providing even just sometimes we can't change the equipment. We just change with knowledge. That has had an impact on people's willingness to stay. University in northern Uganda that was conflict ridden until about 15 years ago. After we started working there, the dean told us for the first time in the school's history, graduate medical students were asking to stay as house officers because they suddenly saw the possibility of what they could do to change. So that to me is also a complicated question because how much of it is the responsibility of these countries? That's why I'm saying the whole model just needs to get blown up and change for some reason because my experience on the African continent is brilliant people. I ask a Ugandan medical student to write down the algorithm for hypertension, they're going to do better than an American medical student. But then we have to provide the system and empower them to be able to live that forward. Some of that is about what we need to do to change. Some of that is about how the system intrinsically needs to change. So this may not be a perfect answer because I think it is so complicated, but I think it's a really important question and conversation we need to be having and talking about because we need to be very honest about what is, when I say we, like the donor role, what we have done to participate in a faulty system um, because that we need to change. I don't know if someone else wants to tackle it. But. No. Let's do a few more. And now maybe let's take a couple of questions at a time because we're getting close to time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Peters. I'm a research fellow at the program in global surgery over at the medical school. Um, thank you all. This has been a really fantastic panel. Um, my question, we, we've talked a lot about um, public development assistance for health. And, um, and Dr. Jai, you're not allowed to answer this question because you just published on this. But what about the um, private sector? What's the role of the private sector in developing global health strategies in looking for things like creating shared value mm -hmm. and bringing in private sector money, um, especially from US companies, but companies around the world in trying to promote the health and well-being of people around the world? Okay, so hold that thought on private sector, um, and let's take one more. And while we're getting there, I mean, there is a lot of conflicting feelings about public-private partnership and engagement. I'm not answering. I'm just asking the question. I more contextualized. I'm just a little more. Con I can't even do that. All right, fine. <laughs> take my question. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna leave. Somebody else, please, just wrap this up. A great moderator. Um, my question has to do with coordination, which we've only touched on a, a little bit on this panel so far. Obviously, we've seen failures of coordination. Um, by governments, by international organizations, by nonprofits in responding to emergency aid situations like Ebola in West Africa and the Haitian earth earthquake, but also in health system strengthening and primary health system building. Um, how do we go about build? How do we go about building better connections and better coordination, uh, better leadership in coordinating resources to address these types of problems? Okay, good. Let's take those two. Yeah, Lois. All right. So I can actually try and tackle both of them with ads from my fellow panelists. So um, on industry and the private sector, yes, obviously. Well, obviously for us. Um, I think what Ashish was alluding to is, uh, you know, you have a lot of conversations that have happened at the World Health Organization and through their various forums uh, where people have really, and this is government and civil society have pushed back to some degree on industry engagement. I think what you have from current leadership at WHO, Dr. Tedros, is someone who's coming in and saying, yes, of course, we need to have um, safeguards in place and we need to sort of manage um, very real um, conflict of interests uh, that can emerge. And also, if we're going to reach universal health coverage, like Marion was saying, we, we're going to need everybody at the table. You know, we need, we're going to need to invite everyone to the party. Um, and that there is there is a no go on something like the tobacco industry, obviously. And, and WHO has a list of other sort of no go actors, but it still leaves the space wide open for a number of other um, corporate entities. And you know, I think I think we kind of get lost in the debate around food and beverage and pharmaceutical or medical device. There's a, there are a whole lot of different companies out there doing work, and you know there's telecom, there's um, you know there, the investment community or finance community, and arguably there, there's sort of kind of 
problematic pieces to all of them. And so what's really important to have in place, which we support, um, is a process whereby we can vet a lot of these parties. Um, and what's been challenging is we haven't really landed on a, on a, on a perfect framework for that, uh, on, on a perfect set of kind of, on a perfect protocol for, for that process. Uh, I, I think WHO tried it with this framework convention, uh, or sorry. Um, FENSA. FENSA, yes, with framework for engagement with non-state actors, really sexy title. Um, um, but even that is, you know, as it's being implemented, is it's, it's not a perfect system. Uh, and so we, as GHG at least, and other actors in civil society are really trying to tweak that so that it can create an environment where, you know, again, everyone is safe and protected from any agendas, including those from NGOs, let me be honest, um, but also can sort of work productively and collectively toward this shared goal. Um, to that end, um, you know, you talk about coordination, uh, and, and increasingly more people are kind of demanding that, right, and not just uh, you, what you rightfully um, put out as examples, like boots on the ground, how we can sort of know what the left hand, how the left hand can know what the right hand is doing, but even at sort of a policy and planning level. Um, one example of how that's, that's playing out uh, right now is this global action plan for the SDGs and the SDG for health specifically. So this is an attempt, and it's a noble attempt, but it's a very sort of weighty one, <laughs> um, of of 12 global health organizations like Global Fund, World Health Organization, UNICEF, World Bank and the like, who focus on health issues to come together around their respective global health agendas. It's been, you know, it's been very tough so far. They, it was a direct or a request from um, a few presidents, including Angela Merkel of Germany, um, the president of Norway, and the president of Ghana, who said, look, you know, you come to us all the time with your various uh, sort of strategies, and it's hard for us to keep track of your funding requests or, you know, your partnership opportunities. And if we're thinking about how to transition this to especially the, the countries who are currently sort of recipients of this funding and of these programs, it's impossible. So get your act together, <laughs> figure out how to come together uh, in a way that will, again, help you but help all of us. So that's in process. I would say watch this space because I think some people are skeptical about whether or not that will really yield fruit or bear fruit. Um, but we, um, there are few, a few of us who are advising that process as sort of people outside the tent. And I think, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful um, that that can be successful because we know that that is critical, um, again, in the work that we do if we're going to, to meet these SDG goals. Anyone else want to add? I'll, you know, I think Lois spoke well to the both pieces, but I'll only add on the, the role of the private sector, I mean, the reality is we're not thinking about if we should open the door to the private sector because the private sector is already in the door, there right? Is, yeah. And in some countries, depending on how you would define the private sector, include, but in some countries, including in Sub-Saharan Africa, 40 to 60% of healthcare in a primary care setting is delivered by the private sector. And countries and ministries are ahead of the game, ahead of WHO, ahead of development assistance partners, and really trying to think about ways to meaningfully engage in, in the private sector. Sometimes that's misdirected, sometimes that's ill-informed. And so I think what's incumbent, you know, maybe the global action plan can help inspire this, but um, it, you know, Vanessa was pointing this out earlier, is to help, is for development assistance partners, technical assistance partners that come from the nonprofit sector or otherwise, to help countries navigate those dynamics better. Think about the right regulatory regimes, think about strategic purchasing differently, think about insurance schemes in more thoughtful ways so that countries are not making the wrong choices, instead they have the capacity to make the right choices for the ways that they engage the private sector. Fabulous. Last question. One last question right here, and then we'll finish up. Um, I'd be curious to hear you guys' thoughts on how to address the NCD crisis. Um, you obviously know this already, but basically that like the U.S. donates about 2% of its aid specifically to NCDs, and it makes up around 50% of the global health burden. Mm -hmm. we, so we tackle, I, you know, we... At the UN Foundation, we tackle NCDs in a really meaningful way that is, you know, if NCDs itself is fairly neglected, what we do, which is around household air pollution, is even more neglected, even by the NCD community. And I think that's a shame because, you know, 
household air pollution is the fourth largest risk factor for premature death around the world. And there are three billion people who don't have access to clean energy solutions for their house, either heating or, in our case, what we do mostly on is cooking. And, you know, loads of evidence around the, the health impacts of that from low birth weight to, as, we, as I already mentioned, kind of premature onset of non-communicable diseases. And there's almost no money from global health partners to an issue like clean cooking. And this goes back to the point that I made at the top of the conversation. We have a global health architecture that's fit for the MDGs, you know, that's dedicated focus on child, reducing child mortality, reducing maternal mortality, tackling HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, but not necessarily where the largest disease burdens are or the kinds of solutions that, you know, will have multiplier effects. If you address household cooking solutions in a meaningful way, not only are you addressing some NCD risk factors, but you're also addressing gender equality with the amount of time that women spend cooking and young girls spend fetching firewood. You also address one of the largest sources of short-term climate pollutants. Um, and so you're addressing climate change as well. So we need to think much differently about the kind of intersectionality as we're thinking about not only NCDs, but a range of global health issues. Great. So we have about a minute left, and I'm going to ask all of you guys just to make brief comments. Uh, one of the things we've heard a lot about in the last hour and a half is the idea that we need new models in global health. We need new models because we're shifting from an MDG era to an SDG era. We're shifting away from focusing on a small number of conditions for a small number of countries to very complex, interdependent kinds of things like climate change, disease outbreaks, um, global health security. and and. This is not one where it's a small number of countries that really deserve our attention. Everybody's in. Um, and then you have in all of this uh, people like Trump, who I see as not leading indicators but lagging indicators. They reflect a set of views that have been growing for a while. They were growing before Donald Trump became president. Uh, sure, he's flamed it, uh, inflamed it and made it worse. Um, but that isn't going away anytime soon, this sort of retrenchment. Um, given that complexity in that environment, are we still optimistic about the future of global health and the future of leadership uh, by the U.S. in global health? And um, if we can just make it brief, but Vanessa, are you optimistic about where this is all going? I am totally optimistic because I've been seeing an extraordinary culture shift. When you look just the climate change movement, for example, I think there's a value shift happening. The pendulum is starting to swing. I think it's all about value shifts, and I'm very... I believe this younger generation or shift in generation is data-driven and willing to, to go where we need to go. Lois. I would split up your question. I'm optimistic about the future of global health. I think that um, stakeholders are recognizing an opportunity to de-silo, democratize, and decolonize this industry. Um, with regards to the US leadership, I think there's still a question mark. And I think that that's OK. I think that that opens up an opportunity. It presents a challenge, but it also uh, creates space for other players to step up, um, including countries themselves. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm also optimistic. And just to take a different la lens on it, I'm optimistic because I'm inspired by people who work in global health and the work that they do on an everyday basis to tie it back to what's happening now in a US government context. There are civil servants who have been working on global health issues at USAID, at CDC, at a range of other you know, instruments and institutions in the US government who are committed to this issue. And they are doing the right thing every day, in and out. And, and I find that kind of leadership inspiring um, as we think about the future. Awesome. And I am optimistic because we have phenomenal leaders in global health, four of whom were here tonight, three of whom are still here. <laughs> um, big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. And thank you all for coming. And big thanks to, Co where's Courtney? Hey, Courtney? Courtney Briggio, who organized all of this and put it together. There were other people, too, but Courtney did the, the bulk of the work.